Welcome to Risen Church's Home Worship. If you're new to Risen, my name is Martin and I serve as a pastor here. If you would like to get connected with us, wanting to know more information about who we are, about the church, fill out a digital connect card. You can find it at risensd.com slash connect, risensd.com slash connect, and we will follow up with you. This morning, as we worship, let us look to Jesus and be reminded of his goodness and grace to us. So as we begin our service, let me just read a passage out of Colossians chapter 1 that encourages us to see Christ for who He is, our King of Kings. Here's what it says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Because of Christ, we can worship today. Rejoice, rejoice. Shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That mourns. Until the Son of God appear Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel Shall come to thee, O Israel O come thou day
We're in the Old Testament book of Isaiah during this Advent season, uh, and the book of Isaiah contains some of the most beautiful descriptions of the coming Messiah, Jesus. And this poem um, from our passage today is powerfully and even beautifully paradoxical because it speaks to our heart's tendency to make good things ultimate things, but also God's unconditional love to woo us and draw us back to Him. And so let me read for us from Isaiah chapter 54, verses 1 to 5, and follow along, um, and the passage will be up on the screen. It says, Sing, O barren one, who did not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out, Do not hold back, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. For your Maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth. He is called. This is God's Word. Isaiah is talking in uh, metaphor here. Uh, Sing, O barren one, he says, who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. Uh, He's saying, you, Israel, uh, this is his context, um, you, Israel, are like a woman who cannot have children. And here's why this uh, metaphor is important. In those times, barrenness was a metaphor for shame because the people in Israel who felt the most shame were women, particularly who struggled with infertility. In the ancient Near East, a a woman's identity was almost completely wrapped up in the amount of children she had or didn't have, especially sons. The more children you had, uh, the better that your family did. The more children that you had, uh, the more your land produced because you had more labor and therefore the more income uh, you had. So your number of children completely, almost completely determined the fate of your family, its status in society and its security uh, economically. Your children were your retirement plan. They, They didn't have 401ks or real estate investments. If you were elderly without children, it meant that you were vulnerable. Uh, There was also a legacy factor to all of this. If a woman didn't have sons, then there was no way to pass on the family name. Women also felt like a disappointment to society because women who gave birth to many sons were considered national heroes because to give birth to a son was to populate the military and make your nation strong and make Israel stronger from a political standpoint. So you can see how in a culture, uh, in that culture, a woman's identity and, and worth is, is, was wrapped up in shame and in the struggle to feel like you're a somebody or being enough based on your ability to have kids. This provides some context for the story of Abraham and Sarah, if you remember the story. Uh, Abraham and Sarah struggled to have kids for many years, and Sarah famously says to Abraham, Give me children or I will die. Now we might think what kind of society would put this kind of burden on women. Women, who, um, women can't control their ability to have kids. Right? This is oppressive. What kind of a heartless society would allow women who couldn't have children feel this way? It is true that ancient cultures oppressed women. And if we are appalled by the cultural identity markers by, that ancient, by the ancient Near East, we have to acknowledge that we too have appalling identity markers of our own. Not to excuse history, but to realize that we are not as innocent. For, for example, it's common in our culture to ask, um, uh, ask someone's, or, or, or to talk about someone's net worth, right? When you hear someone ask a question, what is her or his net worth? Think about that question though. The entire question is bound up not in that person's Uh, and that person as a human being, not in the fact that he or she is an image bearer, not in the fact that uh, that they are members of society, but rather in how much money that they have. Their worth is based on a bottom line number. 
And if you th truly think about that, that's insane. We live in a culture that says, give me the status, the lifestyle, the comfort, the control, the reputation that money promises or I will die, right? We're praying the same prayer in our hearts. That, that's the same prayer of fertility that they prayed back then because that's the same prayer of identity, identity that they prayed back then. Or maybe it's social identity markers. Give me likes and follows and, and, and friends or access to certain social spaces or I will die. Uh, the pressure on students, for example, to today to fit in and to look a certain way or even to be successful and to perform is so high. We have created what um, New York Times writer David Brooks calls a pressure cooker of competition designed to produce students who excel in everything. Uh, David Brooks also says that the family is no longer a haven in a heartless world, a counterbalance to the dog-eat-dog -dog areas of life. Instead, the family has become the nursery where the craving for success is first cultivated. This overemphasis on high achievement is taking a great toll on young people. Studies show that a disproportionate number of young adults have been trying to cram into the fields of finance, uh, consulting, corporate law, and specialized medicine because of the high salaries and the aura of success that these professions now um, bring. And again, to quote David Brooks, he says, students who are doing so with students were doing so with little reference to the larger questions of meaning and purpose. That is, they choose professions not in answer to the question what job helps people to flourish, but what job will help me flourish. As a result, there is a high degree of frustration expressed over unfulfilling work. This is one of the reasons why we partner with organizations like Young Life, because the reality of, of social identity markers or, or success identity markers are crushing our student friends. Young Life leaders care about students whether or not they are successful by the world's standards. And, and we get that, right? We, we have, as adults, we have professional identity markers Give me this place on the org chart or, or I will die. While our professional careers matter, uh, here, here's something that nobody ever tells us. Personal success and achievement lead to a sense that we ourselves are in control, that our security and value rest in our own wisdom and strength and performance. To be the very best at what you do, to be at the top of the corporate ladder, for example, means no one is like you, right? You're, you're, you're supreme. But, but one sign that you have made success an ultimate thing in your life is the false sense of security that it brings. You see, the, the poor and the marginalized, they expect suffering. And, and, and they know that, that life on this earth is ugly and unjust and short. Successful people, however, are much more shocked and overwhelmed by troubles. Not all successful people, but this is a common experience from people with money and power. As a fundraiser for much of my life, I've often heard people from the upper echelons say, life isn't supposed to be this way when they face tragedy. Um, but I rarely, in fact, as I think about it, I've never really heard those sentiments among um, the working class and even the poor. Because the false sense of security comes from deifying our achievements and expecting it to keep us safe from the troubles of life in a way that only God can. Um, give me success or I will die. Maybe it's physical or uh, image identity markers that we struggle with. Uh, if you've ever been tagged in an unflattering photo or video of you, whether in a group photo or something candid, like I remember seeing a photo of myself and I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm like, do I have a gut, do I have a gut? I didn't always have a gut, right? You know, and, and those types of things, they embarrass us, right? We, we feel shame, right? Give me a better angle or a body type or a better look or I'll die. So to all of the shame, to, to the dead womb ex, uh, existence of feeling like we're not enough, by whatever identity markers we depend on, crushing us into the ground in different ways, and, and it's almost impossible when, when everybody else is going after these things, um, not to go along with them and, and be just as enslaved and, and crushed as everyone else is uh, in the culture. 
It's almost impossible. Almost. Because God says there's a way out. There's a, there's a way to emotional inner, inner freedom and cultural, cultural freedom. Um, and what that is, is, well, it says so in, in our text. Um, God says, sing. Sing, O barren one, who did not bear, uh, bear forth into singing and, and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. He's saying, he's saying, I can give you freedom from men, from family, from, from what your culture tells you. I, I, can, I can get you to sing without children. I, in, in other words, look at the paradox. Uh, he says, sing, O barren, one, o, o barren woman who have never bore a child, because more are the children of the desolate woman than, than her uh, who has a husband, right? What God is calling women to do is, is so culturally radical. He, he's calling women to an inner emotional freedom from shame and a cultural freedom from external oppressive structures. What, what this is saying is, um, and, and it's deliberately paradoxical, is the woman who never had any children has more children than the woman who has had a lot of children. That doesn't make um, sense, but it does. It does make sense when you realize that children represent value and worth and beauty and honor. God is saying there's a value and worth and beauty and honor available apart from children. What is the source of that? He says in verse 5, for your maker is your husband. There are lots of images that the Bible uses to describe uh, God's love for us. And one is that of a father to his children. Another image is that of a husband and a wife. And here's why that is significant. Um, every, every other religion says that life is about trying and trying and, and trying and trying hard to live up to standards. And if you really try hard, at the end of your life, you'll have a positive outcome. And, and you'll go to heaven, or you'll meet God, or you'll have nirvana, or something, right? You're, you're, uh, you're in. But Christianity is absolutely different than that. Christianity is a legal standing. Because it's about a, it's about a covenant, like that of a marriage. That's what a covenant is. It's a legal and binding status. It's, it's, it's being united to Christ through the perfect, right? And the perfect metaphor for it is, is marriage, why? Because on the one hand, marriage is the most intense love relationship possible. And yet, it's also a legal status. You've been to weddings. One moment, the two people are not married. Then vows are exchanged. Then boom, right? The officiant announces married. It's legally done just like that. See, that's God's love for us. It's not like you try and you try and you try harder. No, your maker is your husband. And I know that might be weird, uh, a weird idea for, for men especially because men are, men are husbands, right? Yep, yeah, but the church is the bride and Jesus is our true bridegroom. This is what Christianity offers. Uh, that, that is something no other religion um, dares to offer. It says when you join to God through Jesus Christ, the outcome, the verdict is in now. You, you have the praise and the delight of God. No one else even begins to try to offer such a thing. So what is God saying in this passage? He's saying, don't look to anything else. I can be your value. God is saying there's a value and worth and beauty and honor available apart from children, and it's God himself. God is saying there's a value and worth and beauty and honor available apart from careers, apart from social acceptance, uh, and, and even apart from your current marriage. It's God Himself. And what greater value could you possibly have than to be delighted in and sacrificed for than by the Maker of the universe? You have God's acceptance. He chooses you without any hesitation. He says, look at all these other things, good things that you're turning into ultimate things. Don't try to get your value and your beauty and your honor and your, your significance from them. You need freedom from them so that you can love them in a way that does not crush you or them. And, and you'll find that freedom only when your heart rests in God, the, the way you rest in bed at the end of a long day. Only when your heart savors God, the way you savor a glass of cold water in the middle of a desert. If you have that, then you have, 
a completely different sort of identity. You have emotional freedom, you have social freedom, you have cultural freedom, you, ha- you, you can live in your culture. Every culture says that these are good things. Every culture has its themes, emphasis, and, and, and strengths, but they won't enslave you anymore. They won't crush you. God says, For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations, and will people the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not, be, be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced, for you will forget the shame of your youth. And the, and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. So what does this have to do with Advent and Christmas? Well, it's this. God's love is not abstract or theoretical. God's love is not just an idea. God's love is real. And we know this because Christmas happened. God's love is involved, and we know this because Christmas happened. God's love can be physically felt, and we know this because Christmas happened. God's love is compassionate, because, and we know this because Christmas happened. God's love is sacrificial, and we know this because Christmas happened. God's love is thoughtful, and we know this because Christmas happened. God's love is gracious and forgiving, and we know this because Christmas happened. And finally, God's love is present, and we know this because Christmas happened. Let's pray. Let's end our time with a benediction. A benediction is the pronouncement of a blessing that you can take with you. So, Risen Church, may you know how high, how wide, and how deep is God's love for you. Amen.